So I've been playing the Zasser Report 4. Right, we got a nice ripe lead or one here. No funny business. Took a while to come out, but I damn near survived the tsunami this one did. Kill a whole fucking studio in the process. Proper gruesome shit. Now, get to selling. Yes, sir! It actually did too, as well. Or, well, I guess it technically didn't. But you see, originally, they were making the Zasa Report 4 for the PS3 instead of 4. They, being IREM, the studio behind the Disaster Report series, as well as Kung Fu Master, aka the first beat em up, and the R Type series, which is a game about shoot space. DR4, anyway, would be about a massive earthquake hitting a Japanese city. It'd continue the many trends set by the past three games, but focused on smaller scale character driven stories, rather than big demanding disaster set pieces because the PS3 a fuck and also. Oops! Fukushima disaster! Woo! Boy oh boy, it'd be pretty insensitive to release this now. What? HD development was cripplingly expensive for a middle market studio that's nearly killing all of them? Could not afford to cancel one single game? IRAM got dead? Oh no! Luckily, they came back from the new studio called Granzella, made one game about kaiju that had beheld a license, so that stayed in Japan, and then made another mysteriously similar DR4, gave it an English language website, only to then leave it languishing for two years just to announce it in 2019 and release it the following year. And thank fuck they didn't make it about a pandemic or viral outbreak this time, because that would have been really awkward. Uh, by the way, I don't know how common this story is going to be in other reviews. If, if, if I did, just pull up Sonic the Hedgehog has certainly fallen from grace in recent years. Then please kill me, because it's exactly because of shit like that as to why gamers get the bullet. Ready? Fire! But yeah, we earthquake in once more. You play as a creature of your own creation. Nice. As you guide them through the wreckages and wastes of what once was a hustling, not bustling ass city. You engage with other survivors, do some basic climbing and platforming, some minor survival horror style puzzly bits, explore a lot, commandeer some vehicles and find yourself getting roped into many a nutty set piece and of course there is survival bar. One had a moist meter, two had body heat, three had a stress bar and the OG PS3 version of this game had a cleanliness meter. Don't you be you no know, stanky ass bitch lest your character will get depressed letting you take shits to get mental health back cause, cause that's how that works. Sadly, this did not make it in as they went back to a stress bar. A very unobtrusive variety of it that goes away at every safe station of which there are many. The shits did remain though, as it has some simmy mechanics like having thirst and hunger bars, but both are also very unobtrusive and take way long before they deplete and even then I didn't really notice them doing no nothing when low neither. You, you, you do have HP which regains automatically and those bars seem to tie into that, just as that the stress bar can impede your max health, but it also only did so like once or twice throughout the game, like here, where the stress bar also doubles as breath holdy time underwater. All in all though, the survival mechanics, while expanded, have been pushed back way into the background as the game makes way for a more puzzle-heavy, people-talky, adventure-gamey gameplay style. Right off the bat, the first real gameplay you see is the game struggling to even present itself properly, after which you get some deep, heavy options, immediately showing you what type of game this gon' be. Uh, up until the loading screen janks its way into you crawling out of a bus where you'll soon realize that things like the button is still present as they be, as is the brace, the stiff walking, and shit like the compasses, clothes, and inventory management, just now all presented in that classic raw danger-esque, never quite reaching 30 frames per second level responsiveness. Though, there, things moved quite quickly, and here we are defo a bit stiff. Uh, I'll be real, the, the controls just don't feel very good. Walking, interacting, and how it needs to awkwardly cut to animations for shit like door openings and the lagginess of your quick reactions to quakes are all just that bit too sluggish for their own goods. Uh, especially with the walking speed also being far too slow, which does not pair well with the low FPS. Which, along with its PS3 roots, is probably the exact reason as to why this game is one Shenmue as bitch. おかげでいい供養ができました。
Don't get me wrong, it still has some impressive disaster sequences, with massive assets collapsing in great detail in real time, which is not something many huge budget games manage to pull even today, and it still has we needed these like Boat and Scooter, but overall, it is a far more low-key game that focuses less on those things than either of its predecessors not being nearly as set-piece based, as it's more so a game about character moments, mini heart tuggies and fun reveals in which you primarily walk in between dialogue and event triggers and do puzzles. In Wii contain tiny town maps, not at all that dissimilar from, as I already said, Shenmue. I like it though, it's not so much more of the same, but more of the core with a different take. Like in DR1, you'd enter an office building and it'd be on fire and wholly abandoned or some shit. But here it's like functional, as the business folks inside complain about the economy crashing as a result of the quake. All the while the security down below had already left, thus allowing you to waltz in as you did. It's, it's more you human, I guess? down to earthquake. Now of course, this series wouldn't be this series if it didn't then also tie into some mysterious intrigue heavy plot about rival companies trying to screw each other over while down for the count with entire betrayals and twists, but in general, things can defo be a bit more report than disaster, which it uses really well to rev up the intensity of them whenever they do happen. Yeah, the first game had a sequence very similar to this, which was impressive, but the streets were also devoid of life, and that's very much not the case now. Now, it doesn't really in your face to drama at all. These games ain't like that, but man, that's still a pretty rough fucking scene, just seeing these NPCs you could all individually chat to fucking demolished like that. Uh, especially with the increase in realism of how shit's presented, with super loud booming bassy sound effects and the dust clogging up fucking everything 9-11 footage style, the shits were legit jaw-dropping and or IRL shouting at the screening. And the general scarcity of disasters also adds to that for sure. The first game had entire flats falling down in sequence as you ran, followed by a helicopter chase, and the second game put Uncharted to shame, and the third had raining cars and fire tornadoes, and while all of that was great and hilarious and blood-pumpingly exciting, it never really meant anything per se, nor would it be fitting for a game as tonally low-key and personal as this one. Because now, just the one sole building collapsing or quake happening, while a lot less fun carries a fuck ton of weight. Like, like, literally. <laughs> These shits come in. I felt small in the face of these tremors. Trapped, almost. Not to mention that I also gave half of a shit about those being trapped here with me. In a video that I did on Japanese PSP games, I ended up discussing the third game in this series, during which I realized for myself the core of what made it and its two brethren work so very, very well. Being that it nails real life disaster shit tonally, as people don't stop being horny or funny or tired or determined when a disaster hits. People don't just drop their hobbies and interests. Life, as humans would want it to, moves on as normally as it possibly can. In war zones, during natural disasters, or during pandemics, people still do what they need to do and like to do and are who they are. Yet, in most disaster fiction, it is not portrayed as such. 
Shit's always dramatic, tense, with everyone speaking like this, always in the thick of the worst of it. The eye of the tornado, the center of the coop, around or being patient zero, and so on. Shit just ain't real. Shit ain't me or you. And in this series, there is always a time and place for everything. A time and place for you and your bullshit. As the characters here make jokes, dress up funny, help each other out, try to do regular shit and get horny on them, like simply by virtue of it not taking itself too seriously and being unapologetically video gamey, it ends up feeling far more realistic to human nature than any other work of disaster fiction that I'm aware of. And that goes for this game too, albeit in a bit more down-to-earth way. Sure, you still get the funny costumes, which, I mean, if anything, is some of the most realistic shit this series has to offer, as, as we now know, it only takes a few weeks of a pandemic for people's hair to be growing out, and no one's shaving, and everyone just stops giving a shit, like, fuck it, bro, I'm wearing my beans shirt today. But generally, the tone is a bit more serious. It, it, it makes things personal, I guess. Pretty much right away, it confronts you by asking how you would react upon hitting of a massive earthquake. Which I took quite seriously to ponder. Knowing how split and heavy the past games were, I was quite torn between the true to my general optimistic personality, see this as a chance for change, and the protect those close to me. Uh, th th those close being the boy. Uh, the boy one. <laughs> but that alone made me like think about the implications of what was happening and what was going to happen infinitely more than any of the prior games that kick things off with wackiness. It, it made it about me, it dragged me right into it, which it then expands upon greatly by letting you slowly form your own whole origin story and personality, either true to oneself or whatever you choose to RP as. For example, early on when you meet a teacher looking for her students, she can say, move, bitch, get out the way, or hey, what's going on? And then she's like, my students are missing, and then you can be like, okay, I'll tell you if I see them, or <laughs> the female students. I don't know how much you'll change yet, should you go full pervert, but if you do choose to help her and track down said students without waltzing on like an asshole, they'll help you push a truck in a fire so you can then advance to the next area under better conditions than you would have without them. Where there's a seemingly optional store, in which you can find a scared employee who you can then help by clearing the line of angry stressed customers. This then leads to you being able to enter the employee bathrooms, where you'll find the manager stuck inside having just dropped a fat one but not having any teepee, and also this hurtman in the back area in need of some water. And so, you fetch some TP for the homie, buy a bottle off of him, give it to the Hurtman, who then reveals that he is actually the Chastman being chased by the man who you talked to back at teacher, then giving you a key that you can then use in a later area, mentioning that he might meet up with you again. So then, you leave the back area, only to see the manager that you just freed scan this poor baby mama out of her cash over a fucking bottle of water, only to then find out that he wasn't the store owner at all! But instead that this legendary con artist who you keep bumping into throughout the game and so on and so forth. It, it basically keeps stringing situations together like that, which is not only really neat from a basic mystery solvy intriguey point of view, but is also quite strong as these are characters with actual shit going on. The students have this bullying thing with the two bitchy girls bullying the weak one which can evolve quite dramatically depending on how much you yourself choose to meddle. The teacher is also new and thus has insecurities that you can talk to her about. And also like, do you side with the chase man or the chased man? All of this happens just within the first hour or so by the way and so hopefully you can now see how when, say, a single building was to fall on top of these motherfuckers it'd mean quite a lot more than the far goofy goofier and funnier building bonanzas of disasters reported past. Sure, the game might not be as hilarious, but I'd say that that shit's worth its salt just as well. Although, tonally, I also think that the Japanese voice acting plays a big part in making this game seem a tad more serious. Hey, is, uh, is H-Tech involved again? No, they did not survive the dreaded PS3. <gasps> Oh no! Yeah, HTEC, just like IREM, was one of the many publishers, studios, and careers ended by the force of fuck that was the foray into HD. 
You can tell from their wiki as well. See them happily localizing tons of FromSoft games like Kuon, Echo Knight, Evergrace, and Armored Core, various arcade games like Goro, Mark of the Wolves, and Metal Slug, and even some older variants of RPG Maker being full up on in there in that there middle market. Until the PS3 hits, for which they did Way of the Samurai 3, upon which you can see a quick changing course along the lines of, oh shit, oh fuck, oh no, oh god, where did all of our money go? Focusing solely on DSi games, thereafter probably putting their bets on that then being the future of the middle market. And uh, yeah, they were wrong. <laughs> Instead, the middle market just kind of pieced out for a solid six years or so, leaving them to suffer like G did. I will, though, fondly remember their uncanny, funny, and super bizarre game choices in localization. The general oblique esotericness of FromSoft storytelling came out perfectly in their version of Echo Knight, and the epic, schlock-heavy plot twists of Disaster Report and especially Raw Danger were amped up something fierce, with their choices and voices and hilarious tonal shifts, even nailing the sweeter moments of the dangers of Raw. Bit weird how they whitewashed all of the characters and names in the setting, but Hey, it's, it's not like it didn't work in the game's favor at all, because these shits weren't exactly taking themselves very seriously to begin with. And while you could say the same about much of 4, boasting such epic dialogue options as it's not like my choices actually matter here. I'll just watch this train wreck unfold. The wacky, sarcastic, self-aware, over-the-top voice acting is very much not a thing with the actually competent and seriously delivered Japanese VAs maintained in this English release. Now being localized by Nipponichi America, who do all of those weeb anime heavy RPGs like the Hyper Dimension games, the various Persona spin-offs, some Isises, and the Trill mixes, and even whatever the fuck Mugen Souls was supposed to be. In some ways, they continue what H-Tech did, also doing the RPG makers, the SNKs, the funny good garbo like Onechan Barazi to Chaos, and of course, now the disaster reports. But I do also think that it's safe to say that with this release, the days of PS2 voice acting are all but over. For better or worse. The, uh, the writing still definitely kinda be that way though. <laughs> Worried man! I'm worried! One thing that the third game kinda lacked in due to PSP but Raw Danger excelled in due to... Uh, was more open, optional exploration. Being able to crawl under a few roller shutters to look around some stores, a handful of split ends and larger maps, shit like that. Allowing one to find gear, cool outfits, compasses, funky sunglasses, and in some cases even items that could help you solve story situations in a better way. Like instead of your character running from a fire, you may have happened upon an extinguisher letting you put it out so that you could move on no problem. And I'm happy to say that this game builds upon that idea excellently. Right in the first area, you can walk straight into a clothing store and overhear one of the employees looking for a key to the storage room. Immediately, my asshole senses begun tingling, and lo and behold, you can totally find set key and open set storage and find a flashlight, which will be of great use in many a situation later. Which, when then paired with the great sound design and clever use of quiet time as well as the various character vignettes dotted all over the place, the general slower paced gameplay, the first person mode, and of course, the seemingly randomized live earthquakes make the exploration feel super immersive, like anything could happen at any time. Be it the building you're in collapsing, or you happening upon a scary crook, or finding a child in need of saving below some rubble, or just a cool new hat. It's that perfect mix of tension, fun, intuitive problem solving, and relaxation that this series has always excelled in, just now on a much grander scope than it has ever been before. Resulting in whole ass subplots and story arcs, much as I already hinted at. What the fuck? However, because of this low keyness as well, it has more resi style puzzles too. These have always been a part of the series, but wouldn't typically consist out of more than get an item in one room to use in another. And I can't quite say that Force Variant is exactly like that. Th this flat block segment, for example, as much as I fuck with the vibe of it, was quite obnoxious to play given how laborious it was to just get around. I could lay out a whole map to explain how it wasn't intuitively designed at all, but I I think if I just say, imagine getting stuck in Resident Evil 1, needing to get an item in a room potentially at the other end of the mansion, and not being able to just run there, but needing to get there like this.
probably conveys quite well how this can get really old should you miss an item, which I must say many would do too given how the game suddenly sheds its prior linearity out of nowhere, most people probably not realizing that you need to leave the place you're at before you progress first. It's definitely not the most fun I've had, I can tell you that much. Though in contrast, it follows that exact bit up with this cool little Shenmue-esque town in which you get to solve an epic arsonist mystery through doing some private digging. Which, while it defo made up for the puzzles, to me, is quite a different energy than the platformery, arcadey, fun-loving games of Zetai Zetsume Toshi's past. As even that segment, like most things in this game honestly, moves just that smidge too slow for most folks to want to fuck with it. Not to mention this entire town full of assets and NPCs, running out like 20 frames per second at most for the entire two hours that you spend within it. Which really does not gel well with the controls and game feel sucking ass in general. I will say, though, I do love the game's aesthetic quite a lot. It's very PS360. Yakuza 3, Demons and Dark Souls, Nier, Way of the Sam 4, Bullet Witch, Vampire Rain, Lost Odyssey, th that look. We know our textures and models suck, but we can use this HD stuff to push some really mean post-processing and weather effects and shiny glossy reflective shaders to make up for it, only, oh shit, oh no, those totally crushed performance, oh well, too bad. Look. It's weird considering that the PS4 would be capable of much more and it technically is using that as the texture quality is a super duper cripsy, but it's also fitting given that the game started out as a PS3 title and that this studio is simply catching up with wasted time, making the PlayStation 3 game that they still wanted to make just now for PS4 and PC. Looks great though, the sun be glaring and blazing, the white tiles coating Japanese buildings look shiny, the wet streets in rain are quite gorge, not to mention the rain itself being pretty, and offices is sterile, sunsets is steamy, and nights is murky, all topped off with the most 2007 ass subtitle font this side of Yakuza 3. It's the 7th gen AA game we never actually got, but still need it deep down inside. Quite literally, the, the PS3 version looks near identical. Aside from that too, just like the series its PS2 outings, it manages quite a lot of visual variety despite being set within one city. Weather types, times of day, various neighborhoods with different vibes, stores, malls, subway stations, parks, whatever, it runs the gambit very well, and makes sure that each level or chapter or segment has its own style, both in terms of new characters it'll introduce or weak gameplay gimmicks like a raft or stealth, but also a aesthetically and atmospherically. One area, however, where I'd say that it very much lacks in in this regard is its audioscape. The disasters are booming and epic as stated, and I like the bits of music that it has and the overall quiet vibes with the cicadas and shit, but Jesus Christ, the footstep sounds are fucking awful. Yeah. Really making me want to explore, this does. A lot of the more general ones, like the asphalt one, sound almost clippy in a way. And I'm not sure mushy grass was really the right sound effect for this office building. It's such a weird thing to fuck up, but fuck up they did. It meshes greatly with the low FPS and general slow game design as well. Good shit. Well, it's no raw danger. <laughs> that game I'd still say is the best this series has to offer just cause it's so, so, so much and also just has tons of heart. This, while in many ways an apt sequel to it, building upon a lot of what it did, is also a far more low key game with a different heart a more matured, reserved, emotional one that still has a sense of humor, luckily. It is quite good though, generally quite poor game feel and slower pace aside, both of which may be too much for some, honestly, I still very much enjoyed my time with this, even if certain segments dragged it down. Its heart shines past its flaws, and I still found exploring all of the cool ass areas and interacting with the oodles of fleshed out quirky fun characters to be really fun. All in all though, I'm just glad that this studio is still around and that games like this are slowly but surely beginning to exist again, 
PS2 era localizations or no. And besides, this is a cool ass new take on the disaster report formula. If one was about anime plotifying a disaster story, two was about doing that but more realistically focusing on the various sides of survival and the people stuck within it, and three was about romance slash friendships within a disaster, then four is about normal life trying its darndest to keep on going within one. Whether if it's petty towny squabbles, unsolved romances, people trying to sort out their financials, running their businesses, or just looking for ways to entertain themselves and rebuilding their lives, this game covers it all. Which hits home in a weird way now with the current pandemic that may or may not horribly age this video with me bringing it up. It's a pretty realistic take in either case, which makes the game feel quite resonant as it never shies away from its usual light-hearted comedic optimism, even if it is far less schlocky than the the other three. So yeah, whether or not if you'll enjoy this greatly depends on how much jank you're willing to put up with, but for as far as I'm concerned, this was a more than worthy entry in the Disaster Danger Toshi franchise. Uh, good to see the collision is still as good as ever too.